Welcome to episode 7 of this series on Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Last episode, we discussed the first letters of Captain Walton, in which he establishes the arrival of Frankenstein, and captures our attention with the question, just what happened to him? Now it's time to dive into Frankenstein's story, and find out exactly how he came to be on the ice in the first place. Chapter 1 introduces us to the second frame narrative, Victor Frankenstein's story. This narrative is the one we'll spend the most time with, so its setup is necessarily detailed. We begin with Frankenstein's childhood, which, he explains, was a loving and supportive one. I am, by birth, a Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. Immediately, we see that class and birth are an important feature for Frankenstein. Also, that he comes from a distinguished family only raises more questions as to how he became the pathetic figure Walton saves from the Arctic. Think of chapter one as the setup to a later fall of Frankenstein. Shelley takes great care to alert us to the happy marriage of his parents and the comfortable, picturesque setting of his childhood home. Immediately, we're drawn an idyllic picture of a family and of a group that puts a lot of emphasis on love. As Frankenstein puts it, There was a sense of justice in my father's upright mind which rendered it necessary that he should approve highly to love strongly. Early on then, it's being made clear to us that community, love and a connection to our fellow man were crucial to a young Frankenstein. This is crucial given how much of what follows is the result of Frankenstein and others rejecting connections, either out of fear, disgust, or misunderstanding. While the first sentence of Frankenstein's narrative is about family, the narrative itself is also touched by loss. Frankenstein quickly moves on to talk about the arrival of the orphan Elizabeth and the ensuing death of his own mother. Through these events, We as readers are introduced to the idea of loss as a disruptive force and something that changes how we view the world. Keep this in mind as we continue to explore future events. Elizabeth's arrival in Frankenstein's life is also framed as the arrival of something that needs to be protected. Frankenstein himself recounts, after his mother jokes that she has a pretty gift for him, I, with childish seriousness, interpreted her words literally, and looked upon Elizabeth as mine, mine to protect, love and cherish. All praises bestowed on her I received as made to a possession of my own. It's no coincidence that all of this talk about how Elizabeth is Frankenstein's to protect happens amidst moments of loss. This serves as a gentle foreshadowing to us readers that perhaps Frankenstein will fail in his role as protector, or at least that Elizabeth will be in some danger. This foreshadowing is only strengthened by Frankenstein's statement that Elizabeth is to be his only till death. You could also make the argument that Elizabeth, and Frankenstein's desire to protect this orphan girl, runs in parallel with the monster, whom Frankenstein essentially orphans when he abandons his creation and has no desire to protect. As we'll find out, Victor's failure to protect the monster eventually results in his failure to protect Elizabeth. It's a rich segment, setting themes that only become more important as the plot of the novel develops. Chapter 2 serves a similar purpose, giving us more details about Frankenstein's early life and introducing us to his childhood friends, who are important parts of the narrative. Frankenstein's life is still idyllic, As he says himself to Walton, No human being could have passed a happier childhood than myself. He describes his parents as the agents and creators of all the many delights which we enjoyed. His compatriots too are painted in a favourable, sometimes literally glowing light. Elizabeth shines like a shrine dedicated lamp in our peaceful home. And his childhood friend, Claval, becomes obsessed with the virtues of heroes and sets his goals on becoming a gallant and adventurous benefactor of the species. 
We identify both Claval and Elizabeth as sources of great joy and pride for Frankenstein. Understandably, after all, these are his childhood friends. But knowing what we do about Frankenstein's current state, we have to ask where they are now. What happened to them that he is now so far from that ideal existence he painted for us at the beginning of the chapter? Frankenstein himself cuts these idyllic images down, admitting that while he feels pleasure when he thinks back to childhood, the memories are tainted by misfortune. Bright visions of extensive usefulness are changed into gloomy and narrow reflections upon self. At this point, as Frankenstein's account raises more questions than it answers, we readers begin to feel a point of dread. If Frankenstein has gone from this perfect childhood to being a broken man, what has happened to Claval and Elizabeth? These unanswered questions are what Gothic fiction thrive on. They drive us to keep reading, whilst also building the tension. Chapter 2 swiftly becomes 3, and Frankenstein's idyllic childhood leads to the study of alchemy. His father, not a scientific man, was happy for Victor to self-teach on the subject. And as a result, Frankenstein admits he was left to struggle with a child's blindness, added to a student's thirst for knowledge. This struggle for knowledge will be paralleled later by the monster itself, as will many of Frankenstein's other behaviours. Working from books, Frankenstein throws himself into a search, first for the Philosopher's Stone, and then the elixir of life. He soon becomes obsessed with the idea of immortal life. Wealth was an inferior object. But what glory would attend the discovery if I could banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death? This kind of thinking marks Frankenstein as a Promethean scientist, pushing against boundaries that are either forbidden or considered impassable. But it's also a period of romanticism and naivety for young Frankenstein, even if he doesn't realise it. It's only once he's sent to study at Ingolstadt University that his research into alchemy has been a waste of time. His professor, incredulous, tells him that every minute, every instant that you've wasted on those books is utterly and entirely lost. You have burdened your memory with exploded systems and useless names. This is the first moment in the novel when science comes into direct conflict with nature and the struggle between enlightenment and romanticism emerges. While Frankenstein changes his methods of study under new tutelage, he's been infected with alchemical thinking which allows him to approach problems from a different angle and draw inspiration from these older thinkers. Frankenstein's development as an enlightenment thinker is coloured by an experience he had as a young boy at home. He recounts to Walton how, during a most violent and terrible thunderstorm, he witnessed a great oak being struck by lightning. As I stood at the door, on a sudden I beheld a stream of fire issues from an old and beautiful oak which stood about twenty yards from our house. And so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared, and nothing remained but a blasted stump. This is one of the first overt references to light, and by extension, enlightenment in the novel. It's no coincidence that this moment of brightness is also a source of terror and death. As Frankenstein himself puts it, I never beheld anything so utterly destroyed. This is a warning to us as readers that enlightenment thinking and the pursuit of illumination above all else is dangerous and could even be fatal. But Frankenstein is enamoured with all the new knowledge he finds under his tutors. He marvels at what the new sciences have made possible, drawing links between what science is achieving and the work of the gods. They ascent into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, 
and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. Frankenstein finds in new science the methods to deliver on the promises of alchemy, at least in part. He's also consumed by the Enlightenment way of thinking that scientific advancement can only benefit society. As he puts it, The labours of men of genius, however erroneously directed, scarcely ever fail in ultimately turning to the solid advantage of mankind. Enthused by his studies, Victor becomes fascinated once again with the mysteries of life and death. This time, however, he approaches it through more specifically scientific practices. From this day, natural philosophy, and particularly chemistry, become nearly my sole occupation. Frankenstein tells Walton how he engaged in grave robbing to gain access to bodies, which he would dissect in attempts to learn more about the human body. This symbolizes how Frankenstein's research is a disruption of the order of life and death. During these dissections, he begins to wonder where it was that life came from, and as a result, eventually begins to wander back towards the original philosophical ideas he arrived at the university with. At the same time as he creeps back towards those original philosophies, the Gothic becomes more of a presence in the narrative. He develops a fascination with decay and wormed bodies. I saw how the fine form of man was degraded and wasted. I beheld the corruption of death succeed to the blooming cheek of life. I saw how the worm inherited the wonders of the eye and brain. Finally, after days and nights of labour and fatigue, Frankenstein finally uncovers the secret to creating life. The use of the phrase labour should be noted. It's the first of many birth metaphors in the novel and heralds the moment when Frankenstein is almost unavoidably set on his new path. Now, with the secret of life in his hands, Frankenstein is faced with only one more boundary namely those of life and death. A clear line that people only cross in one direction. But Frankenstein, the Promethean Enlightenment scientist, admits that for him it is just something for him to break through and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. Note the significance of light in this passage. Frankenstein's experiments are bearing the fruits of Enlightenment thinking but in doing so, he is breaking divine rules of life and death. His work is effectively supplanting the divine law of God, and he is positioning himself as a new creator. In this moment of discovery, there is again a bleak reference to the idea of parenthood, as Frankenstein states that no father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. These three chapters have essentially served to deliver Frankenstein's rationale and way of thinking to us, the readers. We now understand how he is driven by Enlightenment thinking, but we also have seen how that thinking is touched by emotion and the aesthetics of Romanticism, sublime landscapes and Gothic writing. This combination of ideologies mixes within Frankenstein to create a wholly unstable being. Remember when we quoted Frankenstein earlier, saying, I could banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable. Even as he's advancing along the roots of prescribed science in a bid to counteract the laws of nature, Frankenstein is ironically falling foul of these very issues. He recounts how every night he is oppressed by a slow fever and infirm nerves, his work and toil is not providing the cure to man's ailments, but is indicated as the very source of disease and vulnerability. All of these accounts, combined with what we already know about Frankenstein's fate, are designed to fill us with a sense of foreboding of what is to come. There's been a lot to absorb this episode, but a lot of the themes we've discussed here repeat in and can be applied to future chapters. In particular, did you notice how the Gothic has wormed its way into the text with the details of death and decaying bodies? Next episode, we'll take a look at how that develops, as well as the creation of Frankenstein's monster itself. 